Okay, uh, welcome again. Um, I'm glad to be the host again. And although sometimes when I read these CVs, uh, I experience it as as, as, a, as a lesson of uh, humility. You know, uh, every time again you you notice that you haven't read much actually, and that there are so many interesting things to read and to to, to study. So well, it's a discovery because. It, even if you know the authors, even if you know the authors from far, you look into their CVs and then you see what, all the work that has already been done. So today, again, we have uh, some uh, very, very uh, bright and, and interesting uh, professors with us, uh, specialized in the issues that, that interest us. And the first one is uh, Christian Jokke. Christian, Christian Jokke. And uh, he is a professor of politics in uh, the American University of Paris. Um, formerly, he traveled a lot and he did a lot of um, stops in uh, the uh, world academic uh, network. He was a professor in the International University in Bremen. He was a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He has been working at the European uh, Institute, University Institute in uh, Florence and also at the University of uh, Southern California. His career is a career in sociology with a PhD in sociology at the University of California in Berkeley after being a doctoral student with uh, Jürgen Habermas in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, Christian Jokke has been a guest professor and obtained uh, fellowships uh, in many American and European universities. And he published, uh, as you can expect, an impressive number of highly respected books and articles, uh, amongst which those on immigration and identity and multiculturalism are particularly relevant uh, for the subject of uh, today. Uh, I can announce that his latest book, Citizenship and Immigration, will be published next year uh, with uh, Polity Press in Cambridge. Uh, currently, uh, he is involved in research and writing about the relation between what we call state neutrality and the accommodation of uh, Islam, both in North America and Western Europe. And he is also interested in particular issues related to the integration of immigrants in federations. Indeed, uh, those federations contain different languages, different cultures, different religions, which makes the problems of uh, integration even more complex. And they are already in, uh, let us say, unified states. Virginie Giraudon is uh, our other speaker. And she is a CNRS uh, research professor at a center called CERAPS uh, in uh, Lille. CERAPS stands for Centre d'études et de recherche administrative, politique et sociale. Uh, it is what the French call a research laboratory. It's not laboratory life uh, like uh, Latour and Wuba describe it, but it's laboratory in human sciences. And here, particularly, in political sciences and uh, public law. Uh, and the CNRS, for those who don't know, is the uh, prestigious uh, French center, national center for scientific research. And in France, they have this uh, centralized uh, control you know, organization sorry, of uh, research. Virginie Giraudot holds a PhD in uh, political sciences from uh, Harvard University. She teaches in Lille, and she has also been teaching in uh, Florence at the uh, European uh, University Institute. She has a Harvard PhD, uh, which she obtained in 1997, and this PhD already dealt with the issue, an issue that interests us in our seminar, uh, namely the issue of aliens' rights in contemporary uh, Western Europe. After her PhD, she, she pursued this line of research, amongst others, and because she did other things as well, I noticed in uh, her CV 
And she published a highly interesting work on, on those subjects, such as uh, the book Immigration Policy in Europe, The Politics of Control, in 2006. Today, she is particularly involved in research on European immigration policies, uh, and uh, she uh, dives into this subject through uh, comparative studies of uh, policies. Okay, I think that I said the most important thing about our two speakers. Um, actually, I didn't concert with you about who would take the floor first, but... Yeah. It's Christian. <laughs> It's not meant to be sexist or impolite, uh, but I think I'd say a few more general uh, things, and then we will be a bit more specific, so there's logic to that. Um, can I, the computer has to stay here, I will gently move it to the left, so I don't move it. Um, I draw from a paper that um, reviews uh, immigration policy, can you understand me? That will be more I think it's kind of fixed. Yeah. It's, it's okay. If it doesn't bother me, I will try not to be dramatically moving. Yeah? <laughs> Can you understand? Yeah. Um, uh, I draw from a paper that reviews immigration policies in Europe to give an overview of what is happening in that domain, um, uh, both at national and supranational uh, levels. Um, a few uh, remarks on the stemming versus soliciting in the title. Uh, there is uh, a method to that madness. Um, uh, immigration policy can never be of one cloth, of one piece. At a minimum, immigration policies, always in the plural, are divided between one set of policy that seeks to stem to keep away and to minimize existing flows, flows that are unwanted. And on the other hand, you have uh, a policies under the same label of immigration uh, uh, policy that seek to solicit, to create, to jumpstart a flow that does not yet exist. And that is, of course, a policy that considers immigration as something that is wanted, something that we uh, wish to have. Um, and these two uh, policies, unfortunately, lumped together under the label of immigration, follow completely different logics. Uh, at a minimum, uh, that is very nicely formulated in a chapter by uh, Yaktish Bhavati, Bhavati, this political economist. Uh, um, uh, there are opposite demand supply constellations underlying both policies, right? With respect to um, 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 uh, low skilled, very often unwanted immigration, kind of the uh, supply uh, of immigrants vastly exceeds the demand, and with re respect to high skilled uh, uh, immigration, it is the opposite. Uh, uh, there is more uh, demand on the part of uh, soliciting states than there is supply, and therefore completely different logics rolling out red carpets for one and building fortresses for the other. Now, for almost 30 years, roughly from the first oil crisis in 73, um, um, to the turn of the new millennium, um, European immigration policies have been in the spirit of stemming. Um, Fortress Europe is the logo that best encapsulates that. Uh, now, in the era of globalization, there has been a cautious turn towards soliciting particularly high-skilled immigration. And this is a rather difficult turn, not just because of uh, institutional reasons, what uh, the scientists call entrenchment, path dependencies. Uh, and no, 30 years of stemming policies uh, have kind of fed the image of migrants as resourceful cheaters. And that is a mentality, a, block a blockade of mentality that is very difficult, most difficult to overcome. We need more foreigners of use to us and less uh, who utilize us. This is what the new uh, immigration enthusiasts of the German Conservative Party, the CDU, say. And uh, such crude juxtaposition of use and abuse, uh, very sub not so subtly actually, reinforces the stereotype that is meant to be overcome. 
Now, having said this, there are two main trends uh, in uh, Europe today. Um, the, the first trend is the ongoing, rapidly moving, dramatically moving Europeanization of the immigration function, which started, as we all know, not too long ago with the Amsterdam Treaty and has increased really to a, a, to a big, big extent with a plethora of council directors, uh, most recently on high-skilled immigration passed in this very year. Uh, that is one chunk of development uh, which has to be reviewed and <laughs> continuously updated. This is what I'm doing in this paper. Uh, now, what I'm focusing on today, however, is more at the member state level. And here the most important trend has been to stem, to reduce unwanted family migration and to solicit high-skilled immigration. French President Sarkozy uh, uh, called it a shift from suffered to chosen immigration. And in the remainder of my talk, I will uh, look at this shift from family to high-skilled immigration. In the 1990s, the big issue was still asylum with respect to stemming unwanted immigration. And states have been very successful in reducing the numbers of asylum seeking. Um, if in 92 there were some almost 700,000 new asylum applications, uh, uh, the numbers were down to just 240,000 uh, uh, in 2005. The action really shifted, therefore, from asylum, which has been pretty much uh, settled, um, um, to family migration. Family migration is now the largest category of legal inflows in all but a few European countries. To quote a few examples here in Austria, uh, in 2005, it was about half of all legal inflows being family members. In Belgium, a bit less, it was 37. In France, 61, almost 62% of legal inflows in 2005, uh, family migration. In the United Kingdom, an exception, just 14%. Uh, to give you a few uh, extra European uh, reference points in the United States, an astonishingly high 50.7% family migrants in Australia and Canada on the opposite, a very marginal here, only one-fourth roughly of new legal intakes in 2005 were families. So what one sees is there's a considerable ver uh, uh, variety in the distribution of inflows across uh, 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 legal entry categories, both within the EU and uh, between the EU combined and some classic immigration uh, uh, countries. Um, the, the United States is very interesting to consider here as a case. Uh, uh, one would think that that's a country very successful in attracting high skilled immigration, and it really is, but the legal immigration system is heavily biased in favor of family unification, and one wonders why there is no debate, <coughs> not more debate surrounding that. Uh, the United States, as we know, shifted to a family-focused quota system in uh, 1965 uh, with the purpose of retaining European-dominated immigration within an ethno-racially now neutral immigration uh, uh, regime. And uh, this uh, uh, entrenchment or this uh, sh uh, uh, option for family migration proved immune to revision even when the system came to be dominated not by Europeans, it was meant to be, but Mexican and Asian immigrants in the following years. Um, and high-skilled people enter America not through the legal quota, which are all family-dominated uh, uh, by fiat, by institutional design, no through temporary visa, uh, through the H-1B, the fabulous H-1B. I don't know if you need it, you ever have one? I had uh, two H-1Bs in my short life. <laughs> short life two points, so. um, now, the inspiration of Europe, if it now wants to introduce high-skilled immigration, is obviously not the U.S. There's not much to learn here from the U.S. Uh, it is accepting high-skilled immigration by subterfuge, one could say. No, Europe looks for Canada and Australia as, as models. But one has to see here, um, if one calibrates really the, 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 the different structures, it is over, over, often overlooked that even in Canada and Australia, family inflows uh, constitute more than half of total legal inflows. And if in Europe, the kind of discrepancy between worker and family inflows is particularly <coughs> drastic in France with these 60 plus percent being family uh, 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 for 
corpus. This is also because it's a, it's a matter of accounting. Uh, it is also because even accompanying family members of labor migrants are counted in France within one combined family category. Yeah? Still, with only 13% or so, France exhibits by far the smallest share of labor migration among all European countries. And this makes President Sarkozy's current campaign to move from suffered to chosen immigration rather understandable. And if there's one European country where such a move has already happened, that is Britain. With, I have the numbers here, just 14% family uh, 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 migrants and some almost 45% in the labor migration category in 2005. Um, now, if one seeks to understand the current European dynamic surrounding family versus high-skilled immigration, a comparison with the U.S. is again instructive. I look at my time, I think I'm still um, in time. In the debate uh, leading up to the 1990 <coughs> Legal Immigration Act in the United States, there was a, I studied that in, in a book published in 1999, there was a strong Republican Party attempt to cut uh, the quota immigration uh, of extended family members, the favored fifth preference, as it's being called, for siblings, uh, uh, which is, has been dubbed the brothers and sisters clause, and it's heavily used, actually, uh, by Asians. And this uh, infamous fifth preference uh, uh, within the quota system was criticized for the low skill levels of the people uh, entering on, on this uh, account. And in turn, in the, 90 early, in, in, in the debates surrounding the creation of the 1990 Legal Immigration Act, that was the onset of globalization, uh, if you want, there was an attempt already to increase the quota for high school immigration. There was a sense the people which we get are uh, not good for the American economy, they are too low skilled, so we have to rebalance the legal immigration system away from family dominated to, uh, to labor, and particularly high skilled dominated. And interestingly, this quid pro quo, this substitution game at attempt, yeah, was rejected. It was rejected by the entrenched ethnic lobby, lobby in, on Capitol Hill. And the solution that was eventually found was to increase total annual intakes in order to create space for an enlarged high-skilled quota while retaining the extended family quota, so the infamous fifth preference as absurd as it may be, uh, was not abolished because the Asians wanted it. The logic of this, uh, I interviewed at that time uh, Dimitrios Papadimitriou, who is now uh, at the Migration Policy Institute. The logic was, we avoided choices by expanding the pie. That was the allied solution to this family versus high-skilled immigration conundrum. And in, interestingly, Europe is rather different. That solution would not be possible in Europe. Europe is plagued by right-wing populist parties and, and movements that thrive on anti-immigrant stance. And uh, uh, further considering the absence of anything akin to an uh, ethnic lobby that could entrench family immigration in Europe, there is simply no political space for an additive rather than substitutive solution to the family high-skilled immigration problem. Um, however rational an addi additive solution might appear, of course, in light of Europe's uh, demographic needs. So, accordingly, the European logic is not one of adding up and increasing the size of the pie so that something in it for everyone. No, it, it, the European logic is one of substitution. That is of reducing, presumably, low-skilled family inflows in order to create a space for high-skilled worker flows. And uh, uh, there are, of course, limits uh, to this move. Uh, but in Europe, the limits to this sub substitution game is less an entrenched uh, ethnic lobby, which doesn't really exist here. Uh, no, here it is more uh, rights titles on the part of uh, settled immigrants, because European constitutions uh, protect family rights, and that can only be attacked uh, so uh, much. Um, um, one has to see, really, family immigration in Europe has always been processed, not as a, as a wanted quota immigration, as in the United States, but as 
as of right immigration that has to be grudgingly accepted by states because of international conventions and domestic constitutional clauses that protect family life. Interestingly, however, the European Court of Human Rights, which, as you know, watches over the Strasbourg Convention, has so far been unwilling to invoke the family clause of that convention, Article 8, for kind of reining in on restrictive state practices in this uh, family migration domain. The argument here being that states have a wide margin of appreciation, read sovereignty, in dealing with immigration matters. So even a very harsh and heavily criticized clause in the 2003 EU Family Unification Directive, which uh, allows actually restricting the family migration of children above 12 years, that was deemed acceptable to the Strasbourg uh, judge, uh, judges. Uh, and the fact that across Europe, states have had a free reign and largely unimpeded by domestic courts to raise the required minimum age of both spouses to impose duration of marriage conditions and to raise the minimum income threshold and related material conditions, that all shows all these kind of, from the gift camera, from the gift küche of the recent restrictions on family migration, all that passed without courts having much problems with that. It shows that previously granted rights in this respect are better perhaps conceived as privileges or concessions that may be rather easily, surprisingly easily, easily uh, revoked. Uh, and if there is legal opposition, it is increasingly actually uh, invoking European Union law, uh, which reflects the thorough Europeanization of family migration that has occurred in the past five years. Um, Indeed, European Union law is now very protective of family migrants, surprisingly uh, effective, actually. Uh, consider only the last uh, decision by the European Court of Justice uh, on the famous Metoc case in the, in the, in the, the summer of uh, last year, uh, which it does nothing less than derail member state efforts to fight against marriages of convenience, and it has been criticized as a family reunification rules being hijacked by the ECJ, as some critic uh, put it. Uh, um, while issued on marriages whose genuineness was uh, affirmed by the court in this matter of decision, the mere fact that the resident status of the spouse of EU citizens is now irrelevant for invoking uh, the letter's free movement rights opens the door for massive abuse of the system, as one really has to say. Now, if one wants to assess and uh, evaluate Europe's fight against family immigration, one has to realize that one of its main targets is indeed marriages of convenience. Um, marriages that are deemed to be concocted only for immigration purposes. Uh, and the increasingly restrictive policies in the past few years really home in on resident immigrants or citizens, including increasingly, who seek to be joined by spouses from abroad. The new policies do not apply to new immigrants, actually, uh, uh, who are directly uh, accompanied by the nuclear fo uh, family. Uh, for new immigrants, the story was always the same. Uh, the rules are clear and have not changed much over the years. For new immigrants, it was always high-skilled immigrants could bring their family, uh, be joined by spouses and children immediately. Low-skilled uh, immigrants do not and continue not to have this uh, right. Now, one more word on marriages of convenience. This is not just a, a xenophobic monster uh, by those who want to restrict immigration they would rather not uh, see. No, one has to see up to 80% of the mixed nationality or immigrant marriages that now happen in the Netherlands are uh, estimated to, to 80% are, are estimated to be uh, marriages of, of convenience. And the EU Family Unification Directive of 2003 in Article 16 clearly outlaws such marriages which are deemed as those that are uh, um, conducted with the sole aim uh, to acquire the residence of, of a member state. Uh, a weaker prohibition uh, can be found also in the EU Free Movement of Citizens Directive of 2004. Uh, still, the number of such marriages seems to be high. A British source claims that in 1999, 
76% of those granted marriage status in Britain that year had first been admitted under a different status and 50% of those switched to marriage status within the first six months of stay. Now, such a rush to marriage cannot but be concocted uh, or connected to immigration purposes. So it's obvious that abuse of the system must happen here in rather uh, big proportions. And in the context of the ECJ's metro ruling referred to earlier, um, Irish officials uh, pointed uh, to an unusual, I quote from a document from the uh, Irish government, they pointed to an unusually high number of Latvians from Latvia uh, who married Pakistanis, a rather unlikely uh, love affair across groups here. And there were media reports uh, that Polish and Bulgarian women are contracting marriages of convenience for as little as 800 uh, euro. Now, the question is, <clears throat> is, is there method in this substitution game from uh, suffered to chosen, from unwanted family to wanted high-skilled immigration, as the logo of Sarkozy indeed would suggest. However, if you really look at the policies in a variety of other countries, I, I, I'm not so convinced that, that there is method and intention in the substitution uh, again. And, I mean, uh, while the coincidence of fighting family immigration and moving toward high-skilled immigration in the, about the same time this dual tendency is happening, this is conspicuous, that's clear. This coincidence is certainly conspicuous. But one has to consider that there are domain-specific uh, considerations at play, yeah? such as fighting an obvious abuse of the system, as I just tried to suggest. Um, and in addition, one has to see there are integration concerns with respect to a widespread practice among second and third generation Turks or Moroccans, particularly in the Netherlands, that is very obviously documented, to look for marriage partners not in uh, uh, the outskirts of Rotterdam, but uh, in uh, Turkey or in Morocco. And uh, that is the backdrop here, or the kind of the context for the new integration from abroad schemes that were invented by the Netherlands and now, however, are also practiced uh, by other countries such as France and Germany. Um, so, I would think uh, there are domain-specific considerations that drive policies uh, both with respect to family restrictions and expanding high skill. And uh, in France, clearly, the logo suggests uh, an intention on the part of the government, but in other countries, I'm not so sure. However that may be, uh, Patrick Weil, <coughs> always good for nasty comments, uh, and Sarkozy, because he's a socialist pet, um, um, and he found this, uh, what Sarkozy wants, he gave figures, he, he gave figures. We have to move uh, the skill uh, the intake or the share of economic migration from what it is now under 10%, we have to move it up to 50%. He told that to his minister. And if he doesn't follow, he will be fired. You know, like Donald Trump, you're fired. Uh, he uh, has no scruples uh, to do that. Um, um, and Patrick Weil argued this is absolutely unrealistic. And actually the first results, he's now uh, two years almost in office, right? To show uh, that it's not, not nearly as he, uh, in the margin of the, uh, achieving that. Uh, why is it told absolutely unrealistic? Simply because family migration, as unwanted as it might be, and it certainly is, it is still as of right the migration that is protected by the French Constitution and by the international conventions that uh, France is a signatory uh, of. And most importantly, and increasingly so, by European law. How much time do you have left? Talking for 20 minutes? Still uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, okay. Then, uh, good, don't have to rush like the TARDIS. Um, <laughs> um, um, now I look at two countries um, uh, more specifically and uh, how they are uh, now taking this cautious turn to high skilled immigration. And there are <coughs> 
a lot of variations in how aggressive and how uh, explicit and how kind of adventurous this, this term is. Very, very adventurous, very, very aggressive Britain, extremely um, lame duck, almost non-existing and self-defeating, uh, the case of uh, Germany. Um, now, uh, um, a look at uh, Germany, perhaps. Uh, Germany, interestingly, was Europe's pioneer in moving towards high school immigration. And it was Chancellor Schröder who gave out this uh, uh, green card uh, proposal. And uh, he wanted to recruit uh, some 20,000 high skilled engineers from Bangalore. Um, and uh, uh, actually, uh, not uh, nearly as many as he wanted to have came um, uh, because of the stinginess of the proposal. Uh, just if for five, five years, then it's finished, then you have to leave, uh, and you cannot bring family, and so forth. I mean, somebody who is highly skilled, he goes to California, he doesn't go to Bottrop and, and uh, the other mediocre German cities. Uh, so the Germans then talk a lot, but now we have to really <clears throat> do it better the next time around. And so came the new immigration law of 2004. And it was a total defeat, uh, again, of this attempt to be more open to high school people. It was tellingly entitled, Law for the Steering and Limitation of Immigration. Zuwanderung. They still don't call it uh, Einwanderung, Immigration. They call it uh, Inmigration, to uh, say it's uh, not really immigration of the classic type that we want. And it's called a law to really limit uh, such immigration. Uh, and the initial proposal uh, by the Süßmut uh, 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 Commission to introduce the Canadian point system was flatly rejected because the CDU didn't want it. That's the main reason. The CDU didn't want it and their uh, agreement was needed because of the Byzantinic uh, uh, German policy making process where the lower chamber uh, or the, the Bundesrat has to, uh, has to pass any, any law uh, and affirm any law proposal that comes from the parliament proper, and that is uh, at that time under, in, under the control of the conservatives. Yeah. So the main innovation of this 2004 immig immigration law <coughs> is mainly procedural, and it moves from a very complex, Byzantine indeed, system of multiple residents and uh, separated work and uh, residence permits to a very simple system of just two residence titles, either temporary or permanent, and what they call one-stop government that combines work and residence permits. So you, can all, you no longer have to apply separately uh, for these two uh, types of permit. But interestingly, formally, the 1973 recruitment stop is still in place. Um, an exception is only made for high-skilled uh, immigrants, but in a very timid uh, way and a way that is difficult uh, to meet in reality. Because high-skilled immigrants are now granted, <laughs> indeed, I mean, that's, that is a positive aspect of the law, high-skilled immigrants in Germany are now granted an immediate permanent residence title. That is rather unique. It totally breaks the European logic uh, of a gradual, uh, uh, a gradual move from temporary to permanent residence, which uh, makes Europe very different from America, where, of course, a permanent title is available from the day uh, one of, of uh, Arriving, so that is the the one positive thing: this uh, immediate permanent residence permit. Uh, but other problems <coughs> are thrown into the system, like sand. Uh, those who are high skilled need to show first. They need to show a job offer at hand. You must have a job offer before. You cannot just come there, kind of cold turkey, and then try it out if you hire highly cold. No, that's not possible. And you have to show that job offer. Initially, it had to be eighty-four thousand euro high quite high. Germany's salaries are not bad, but they're not that good, particularly for young people, how clever and how high qualified they ever may be. In subsequent uh, moves, it was reduced a bit to 63,000 euro, but this is still very, uh, very high. So, in the summer of 2005, when the new policy was half a year into existence, not a single high-skilled immigrant had arrived under such uh, conditions. And in the entire year of 2007, as few as 460 high-skilled people arrived on this, uh, on this uh, premise. 
the only true innovation next to the procedural uh, advantage now of having a permanent uh, a residence permit uh, up front, the only true innovation apart from that is um, foreign students are no longer required to uh, go home after completing their degrees at a German university. No, they now have one year time to find work and then they can move on to permanent residence in that country. And uh, um, uh, if you consider the pending uh, internationalization of the German university system, which was recently boosted by a big, big campaign for creating excellence universities and excellence research clusters, now the student route seems to be Germany's main bit for entry into the global race for talent, as my colleague uh, Ayelet Shahar calls uh, the competitiveness of, uh, of high school immigration regimes across the Western world. That was Germany, rather meekish. They couldn't give up this stemming mentality, as it were, right? And that kind of blocks their foray into being a serious player in the uh, competition for scarce, highly skilled uh, people. Britain is very different, and with Britain I will close. I still have kind of five minutes time, or I, uh, I could also, yeah, okay. Britain uh, is today Europe's most advanced, most competitive player in the global race for talent. Uh, already in 2002 they had their highly skilled migration program, as it was called, <coughs> and it granted a one-year visa without employment at hand. So in Britain you can come, you meet the point threshold, and you don't have to show that you have employment at hand. So you can come cold turkey and try it out. Um, there's trust, we will make it. Um, 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 and this uh, initial 2002 uh, policy was replaced in 2008 by what I consider the most uh, high-tech uh, immigration system anywhere in Europe. <coughs> it's called the New Point System. Uh, it covers the entire economic migrant spectrum from high to low-skilled uh, people, not just high-skilled people are now treated under this point-based uh, system. And it's, this reform is really, there's no understatement if the Home Minister at the time called it the most significant change to manage migration in the last 40 years, indeed in Britain it is, and perhaps in all of uh, uh, Europe. Um, a high-skilled immigration is in this new points-based system one of five tiers other tiers are skilled, so not quite high, but skilled, and then low-skilled students and temporary workers. Uh, and the high-skilled uh, top of the line, of course, is geared towards uh, doctors, engineers, finance, and IT specialists. And uh, uh, it is triggered by meeting uh, minimum uh, point threshold for qualification, previous, previous earnings, not earnings you might have now, and age. Um, there is a nominal tier in that new points based system for low skilled workers, but if you read the, uh, the, the government document introducing the new policy, it would not be used, it will not be used as long as there are sufficient numbers of workers available from the uh, newly enlarged EU, the famous Polish plumbers. Uh, uh, they meet uh, the need that uh, uh, Britain has for low-skilled, even though I would never call that low-skilled, one knows how expensive and difficult it is to get a good plumber, but it's officially considered uh, a low-skilled. So interesting, there's a hidden racial motivation by the Brits in saying we, we want to phase out uh, 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 low-skilled immigration from Asia and from uh, Africa. We have the Europeans available, they create much less adjustment problems. Uh, that is the hidden uh, uh, mentality, the hidden logic behind behind that. But the, the basic line is the Brits simply want to out, um, they want to abolish uh, legal low-skilled immigration in the long run. And the whole system is totally geared towards high-skilled immigration. I think that has implications for the gentler approach in general to integration, to civic integration as these policies uh, uh, to accept and uh, turn newcomers into adapted members of Western societies are called. It's a little bit gentler in Britain and less harsher in the Netherlands, but the under story, the underlining story is that it's only geared to high-skilled people, not to uh, low-skilled uh, people at all. Um, 
uh, actually the mentality towards low-skilled people is rather draconian. Uh, um, low-skilled people, if they should be accepted at some point in the future, if you read the, the strings attached to them, it's like uh, uh, the conditions for prisoners on leave, as I call it. Uh, there would have to be effective return arrangements with the country of origin. Entry would be limited to 12 months and no dependents, uh, no family member, members allowed to join you, and no right to switch to a different status, a more permanent one, later on. And a quote from the document of the government, we are considering options such as compulsory remittances, requiring open return tickets so that you have to, you can enter only if you show in your return ticket right, at the same time. And of course, biometric capture to ensure that workers return at the end of the stay. Now, if one considers innovative uh, moves uh, by the Brits on the, on the front of immigrant integration as well, something which I have not uh, been able to touch upon here, uh, with a new policy that now favors citizenship uh, over uh, illegal permanent residence, very interesting move, they're actually about to abolish uh, post-national membership, Alliance against Soiser, at least that was a proposal, it's not... Uh, turned into law. Perhaps not yet, we don't know. So really, Britain is now Europe's uh, laboratory for really a new migration world, as one would call it, um, in which not just the opposite logics of uh, stemming and soliciting are integrated within one policy, that is the ambition of the new points-based system, no, but where immigrant selection and immigrant integration are also integrated into one coherent system. But this, of course, appears too neat on paper to ever match a messier, uh, likely to be patched, worked uh, reality. So these are my ruminating, uh, this is my ruminating walk through this landscape of uh, cutting down on family migration, uh, increasing emphasis on high-skilled immigration. And the question, is there a linkage, intentional uh, policy linkage between these two different moves? The answer is, in France, most certainly in other countries, uh, I'm not so sure. And the whole turn of Europe towards solicited immigration is really still kept back by the mentality of stemming. Yeah? That migrants are resourceful cheaters, and the control logic still kind of dominates. And so, no wonder, there's a very interesting um, statistic by Philip Fox, the Mediterranean Migration Report, which was compiled at the European University Institute a few years ago, and then the statistic shows that immigrants from Met MENA countries, as they are called here, this Mediterranean, um, uh, Middle East, North Africa countries, um, the high skilled people of those don't go to Europe. They go to Australia, to Canada, to the United States. But 80% of the low skilled people from this region actually end up in uh, Europe. That is a reality very difficult to change. But now I Controlling a new migration world. Uh, when we were already using stemming and soliciting, uh, I think that got to me. Um, we, um, it's also not a human being, it's prestigious to me, and, uh, and it's been an inspiration to the entire uh, field. Uh, I would say since that famous World Politics uh, article, Unity the 1999 book that followed. Uh, and also was kind enough to bring a bunch of scholars to the EY in Florence in Tuscany for one year in 97, 98, uh, and included people like Andrew Geddes, Yasmin Sosa, and others uh, that you may have read uh, uh, otherwise. So uh, uh, we disagree on some things, I'm sure. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll try to save that uh, towards the end of the talk if I have any real fundamental uh, disagreements. But actually, um, well, if we manage to write a book together or to edit a book, we must be agreeing on <laughs> at least on the approach and indeed on this comparative approach. So the way I uh, thought about this was more to try to be complementary and maybe bring some, some uh, new issues on the table, or well, not new, but maybe a different perspective uh, uh, on, on this issue. Um, and let's go back perhaps in some sense, the way I started to think about this was Indeed, we have a lot of dichotomies. Dichotomies uh, can be analytical, can help us analytically to be, uh, and dichotomies are sometimes indeed produced by uh, researchers. And that's the case of stemming and soliciting. You could say this is a Yop invention. It's not a Sarkozy invention. The Sarkozy invention is immigration subi, immigration choisi, the suffered or the chosen. Uh, Sometimes, of course, we have to work with, uh, indeed, categories that are produced. Legal, illegal is a good one because you could say for some lawyers it's fine and for sociologists it's uh, value-laden and, and bad. Uh, we have, you know, skilled and unskilled immigration policy versus integration policy, national policy versus EU policy, and my favorite is sunshine versus shadow <laughs> politics. Um, so I just want to say a few words and try to see how, uh, how could we how helpful they are, or if they're not, uh, if there's a better way of, of going about it. Standing and soliciting, Christian has already talked about this uh, quite extensively, uh, but indeed, although you could say there are different logics to that, uh, as Christian pointed out, uh, in some contexts, in particular in the US context, but you could say that in Canada as well, uh, you cannot, uh, there is not something that would be unwanted family migration, unwanted highly skilled migration. My parents um, moved to Canada with myself when I was 14. I don't think my dad would have said, oh sure, I'm coming, but you know, uh, Colette and Virginie are staying behind in Paris, and you know, I'll just come and visit once, or, you know, once a year. This is of course what low skilled migrants uh, during the post-war era and still today did, you know, in a, um, uh, but of course for highly skilled uh, you know, doctors, uh, that doesn't make any sense. So this idea that you could somehow have this, uh, uh, try to stem some flows while wanting others, sometimes it's, it's not such a neat uh, uh, dichotomy. But Christian has said a, a, a lot about that as well. Legal and illegal, why am I connecting this to stemming and soliciting? I spent a few years in Italy and this is typically the kind of place where sometimes you like to of course, explicitly in political discourse, you cannot say that you want to solicit illegal uh, uh, work. Uh, neither can you say that in the UK. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard not to think that since you are not, in some sense, uh, um, putting any controls, labor inspectors, uh, etc., on sites, that is really, it's, uh, and at the same time, there's good reasons why both because of the pay they are receiving, etc., and because of the needs that you have. You're trying to solicit illegal migration. This is not politically correct, but that you know, happens in some of the uh, uh, cases that uh, I looked at. And the unwanted migration, indeed, uh, that Christian talks about, is legal. And he puts, you know, again, he said this is as of right, uh, sometimes called a humanitarian, and you know, it's in the entrenched in the Constitution. So there's also not this idea that there would be an unwanted illegal flow and a wanted legal one. Uh, that's another uh, dichotomy I just wanted to sort of, um, make sure we skill and unskill. Now, this is perhaps where it's not a disagreement with Christian, but uh, this you know there's been a lot of talk about indeed highly skilled, uh, but in fact uh, the picture is a little bit more complex because there are also sectors. There's Basically, I would say, first of all, there are sectors uh, where you would need both skilled and unskilled workers. But as you know, especially for the, you know, if you get uh, uh, flows from within the European Union, where you don't have the issue of, in some sense, you know, just looking at uh, other examples as well from Ukraine, which is not yet an EU member state, uh, but just from East and Central European countries moving to to the West or the UK, there was a lot of de-skilling, a lot of, you know, basically nurses ending up uh, as waitresses. And this, 
in fact, is a very old story of the sociology and the economics of migration. When you migrate, in some sense, you are willing to pay a cost, uh, as the economists would say, for future benefit. But you know, how many mathematicians, uh, Russian mathematicians, that immigrated to the States to become beauticians in the 80s? How many uh, you know, uh, Russian Jews went to Israel and, you know, with incredible <laughs> degrees and ended up also, at first, uh, completely de-skilled, meaning doing jobs that didn't correspond to, uh, to that. So that's one point, and that's, that's quite clear now in some of the flows from East uh, uh, to West in Europe. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have a sort of, the, what's, what's interesting, I think, in the German example that we discussed is, there's this idea of you know, the IT specialist, while in some cases we have to look at the broader picture of the incredible amount still of seasonal work and circular migration that involves fairly, that doesn't require diplomas or skills in the sense of education, but particular technical skills. I'll talk about strawberry picking. Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea of what I, uh, of what I mean. Um, Immigration and integration. This is another, you know, this is also a classic division. There's immigrant. Uh, Thomas Amar, a Swedish scholar, used to actually the word, uh, he, he talks about yeah, migration policy and immigrant policy. So basically, it's a dichotomy between policies that uh, are uh, about you know, who enters, who stays, or, and who exits. And then there would be this other set of policy, which would include as well access to citizenship and anti discrimination policy which really concerns how do you deal with people once they're uh, uh, there. And that's a very neat, seems very simple, and as I said, we need as scholars, we need these analytical categories, and you know, it's a sort of, you have a badge saying, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a control and security migration person, or I don't know, I'm, I'm an integration policy person, I talk to my and all this stuff. But, you know, beyond this, you know, this, what's interesting, I think, in the recent trends, uh, is precisely the blurring of the lines. Um, I think that's for many reasons. One was invoked by Christian in his usually unusual provocative style, which is uh, his take on marriages of convenience. But what you didn't mention, which is mentioned in the paper, is clearly if you look at the Dutch policy, they were the first ones to really politicize this issue and take it very seriously also in policy circles, in a very gendered way, by the way. So the idea is Dutch women are stupid and they will marry, so Dutch women with a passport are stupid and they will be lured by African men that they meet on the beach in Senegal or Ivory Coast on holidays and will try to, you know, yeah, abuse them to, to come. Which is a bit of a different story to then the second generation Turk or Moroccan going back to, you know, and trying and using that as a chain. But this was originally the, 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 the picture. There was also a very gentle way. Uh, in the UK as well, there's a famous uh, court of, uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, ruling, which also uh, actually had a different treatment of whether you could bring a wife or a husband. It was fine bringing a wife, but it was not fine bringing a husband. So this idea of, you know, uh, it was kind of interesting. So back to my immigration integration, uh, 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 as we see in the Dutch case now, which is an extreme case, but already being copycatted and followed and imitated by other European countries, we have integration courses, language courses and tests prior to obtaining a visa in the country of origin, in the consulates that you, know, you pay for, you train to pass. Now, the idea in 1994 when the first discussion of integration contracts for Newcomers came in the Netherlands, it was called integration courses for newcomers. It was once they were there to teach them the Dutch language and Dutch values so they would do better on the job market or do better in school if they were minors. Now we consider that in fact, you know, they are, you know, back to, to what Christian was saying about this idea that marriage is just, you know, a sort of a, a filière, we say in French, just a, you know, a way, a back door, or whatever you want to call it in English. Uh, to that, you see that you know there's also um, you know the idea of having an integration course before you even apply and set foot in the Netherlands uh, shows shows this blurring of the line. Um, I think it started a long time ago before uh, when uh, with asylum seekers in the sense that you know you, you want to have asylum seekers separated from the rest of the population 
because you know, and that's true, that once they start, the children go to the same schools as the uh, other children, the people start working with other natives, even those who might think of themselves as anti-immigration, they don't want the friend of their friend in school to be expelled. They don't have to be, you know, whether, you know, they're, they don't have to be left wing to do that. Uh, in Paris, there's a big movement, and, and as well in France, uh, of parents trying to prevent the expelling uh, mm -hmm. um, undocumented parents, basically, to be expelled. And, you know, if you look at these, of course, always have the, the activists. But, you know, the idea is you really want to, you don't want them to integrate if you ever want to have a chance to expel them. Yeah. National EU, that's a complex one, and that's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, um, Christian has pointed out to the Europeanization uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of immigration, and I would say increasingly, indeed, there's a beginning of inter labor immigration policy, and now we have integration guidelines, and of course we have a transformation policy at EU level. At the same time, it's not an you know, it's a very complex as well uh, system. There's still incredible leeway, of course, in the directives. Uh, but there's also, when you look at, uh, there's also a sort of two or triple level game now between national level and EU level um, 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 uh, in their relationship with sending countries, or transit countries, that mm -hmm. in particular, uh, uh, Africa, but also Asia. And also, I think as, uh, <coughs> was pointed out in Christian's paper, perhaps not in his presentation, uh, and I've been writing about that for a long time, is this race for talents, I don't think Europe is united enough to say, you know, I, okay, we are going to have a common pool of talent. No, 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 the Germans <laughs> want it for Germany. <laughs> but they don't want it for EU27. That makes no sense to them. So the idea that but they're still very much, when it comes to labor market policy, very national. Um, um, perspective or, or uh, you know, it's, uh, you know uh, way before the recession, and, you know, which has made it probably uh, worse. Mm -hmm. The last thing before I move to the, my little matrix, or if you will, the, the points I want to make is uh, uh, the problem, of course, with all of that, as I said, some are analytical categories, some are political terminologies, and in the end, there's also what we see and what we don't. Uh, I'll give you one example highly skilled migration. Which, is, which are intra-company transfers. Now, this is mainly a phenomenon in the United States, but there's about 200,000 people concerned in the UK. They don't appear in statistics. They're nowhere to be seen. But as far as I'm concerned, these are people who work in the UK. But they're not seen because they're, they are part of freedom of services and move within, you know, move within, uh, within companies. So there's uh, also many ways of shedding light on one aspect and not on, on, the, on the other. After all, that's the sort of essence and basics of politics. Since Amy Schachtlein was wrote the semi-sovereign people back in the 60s in America. Um, so, uh, and after the categories, I just want to move on now uh, with uh, how to make sense of the amount of variation we're going to see in Europe uh, over time between countries and also what looks like contradiction. Now I'm in STEM and Sunnistic, we, we know this, this, this strange uh, sort of uh, mix. Uh, but if, oh, actually I'll show the slide after that. Um, no, actually maybe I'll show the slide now. Now of course this is all premised by the way on the idea that Europe is super attractive and everybody wants to come to Europe. This is actually carrying data, so the same project that Christian Jokic just mentioned. Uh, Karim is a project based uh, 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 yeah, at the EY which gathers data on both, uh, so on, uh, migration from uh, the Mediterranean. Now, when I, I just focus on Morocco, so it's not all, uh, all of the beta countries here, right? Um, but I think Morocco, especially in Belgium here, but I think it's an interesting group. Um, so this map shows, it's the same idea as Christian, it's just in the map. Um, where do um, uh, first generation migrants coming from Morocco, where do they settle? Now clearly France is still uh, the darker country, the one that has the most uh, Moroccans. Belgium and the Netherlands as well are pretty... Uh, you have now Italy and Spain. But if you look on the other side of the Atlantic, you also have two countries 
with a significant number of Moroccans. And these are actually, and these are the first, by the way, the first generation migrants. These are people who move directly from Morocco, or sometimes uh, students who have <laughs> been to France. 10% of all foreign students in France are Moroccans. I think there's quite a substantial number in Belgium, but I don't have the figure. So, but I know for France it's, 10, it's, one, it's one in 10. Who actually sometimes after studying in France go to the US and Canada because they're facing, you know, they are facing discrimination when they try to get a job in ways that they don't in the States, or in ways that they they want in the States or Canada. Because Canada, on top of that, there's also sometimes if they're studying in France and linguistic, you know, if they're reading French for Quebec, that might be, that might be useful. I just wanted to show the, the slide to say, you know, maybe we need indeed to sit back and think not every, you know, Moroccan wants to come to, uh, uh, to, come to Europe. Um, so back to trying to, to figure out these different logics. Uh, Christian's book of logics, and I think I'm going to go for that as well. Uh, I'm going to try, this is the super simple model, right? And I'm going to try to bring in some more uh, 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 factors uh, uh, after that. Indeed, what I've done is I've tried to separate at least, can you hear me? You don't, I don't need to, okay. Um, Let's try to see, you know, there's obviously, I'm not talking about why the people migrate I and mean, the push and pull factor, I mean, that's, that, you know, why, they just assume somehow that, uh, you know, but they're still, in the non-US context, or in the Canadian context, NGOs are very much also mobilized in the labor demands, but they don't just focus on human rights, they're not just fighting, you know, they're not just basing their arguments on, uh, on, uh, on this human rights issue, uh, 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 in fact, I mean, you know, what we call ethnic lobby, all these associations. And, you know, we love the Irish, we want more Irish in America, more, you know, more Cubans, more whatever, uh, whatever it is. So I agree with, with this logic. There are different, and of course they confront each other, but you could say that you could look at them somehow individually, first of all, and see that, uh, that you know, some of course come from more standing and some from more solicity, right? So I'm assuming public opinion political parties are going to be on the standing side, uh, if you will. But this will be limited by liberal legal norms in some sense. You know, there's so much you can uh, uh, do. And the labor demands I'll go back to in a minute, because I think that's still the black box. And I'm not an economist, so I'm going to, but I'll talk as a political economist, for example, uh, uh, in that sense. Now, of course, across Europe, we cannot expect that business and labor or political parties and the media or the courts and NGOs are all the same, right? So this is my second column, which I call institutional filters, if you will, or institutional factors, whatever you want to call it, which should vary across country and they can also vary across, some of them can vary across time, if you will, um, uh, and which make a different, you know, so I gave some example and I'll come back to that, you know, Labor demands uh, and business demands depend also on labor market institutions, industrial relations system, welfare state organizations, uh, and I'll come back to that, so I'll be quick here. Same thing, populist parties, they're everywhere, but they don't have the same, you know, uh, you know depending on the party system, you know, they have different uh, government tactics, etc. I'm just, you know, I don't have time to go over them. But because of that, you have different logics at work modulated by country, if you will, uh, uh, depending on the various uh, dynamics within each of these logics, if you will, uh, you end up with what seems not so clear, not so coherent as a set of policy choices or policy decisions, which I distinguish from outcomes, right? So, on the one hand, you want labor recruitment, but that's not very politically palatable. So you try to do it in ways that are not so obvious. So I mentioned intra company transfers, but also we talk about fiddling with the statistics uh, in some sense. Um, uh, also, the way you would, uh, um, and that's maybe where Christian disagrees, because some people want now in France, of course, you want to show that you actually have workers coming, uh, but this doesn't, uh, um, it's not. Uh, Anyway, I would say it's only in some, in some sector. In the same way, you still have a standing logic which tries to accept, 
to um, uh, in some sense have decisions taken in place where there's very little oversight by judicial institutions uh, and courts and fairly closed access by the for migrant NGOs, if you will, uh, uh, which for me is the European level, no matter how, you know, even post, uh, post to, uh, 204. Uh, remote control in society, again, of also trying not to have people arrive where they will indeed uh, uh, have some uh, legal protection, if you will. Um, um. So you have, in the end, policy outcomes, which are, yes, more liberal migration, but you still have family in the union. You have this segment, you know, in the end, you have this uh, 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 strange uh, and very, not incoherent, but, you know, mixed picture compared to what the initial <coughs> political story is called, right? You know, we want to stem, we have wanted and wanted immigration choisi, immigration suivi. But in fact, there's an act of strength by, uh, um, on, you know, beyond the legal sphere, and uh, uh, legal constraints and uh, labor demands um, to, to make this a you know, more blurry picture or complex picture at the end. Now, this being, being uh, said, uh, Already, this is a pretty complex policy mix between standing and soliciting immigration and integration. Uh, but I want to uh, just maybe, uh, I have five minutes, ten minutes, okay. Just give, take uh, political economy or at least uh, 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 the demand side issue uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more more seriously. So, which was in my earlier slide, this idea of. I talked about uh, labor demand. Do we need, you know, if you talk about soliciting, you want to solicit people, you need them, do you need them to what extent to do what? And indeed, whether, what kind of skills? If you look across uh, 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 Europe, it's obvious that it's one of the least, I would say, something that migration scholars have not thought about much for a long time. Uh, and that welfare state people have not paid attention to at all, uh, which is the relationship between migration in the sense of soliciting policy, you know, labor, de migrant labor demand, if you will, on the one hand, and welfare states and labor market institutions on, on the other. So a lot of the discussions, including by very prestigious people, um, you know, whether it's here, Stein, Anderson, who is just discovering you know, us now things to say about migration. Um, uh, or, you know, the various varieties of capitalism, authors, etc. Now, why is that interesting to take into account? Uh, if you look at one of the, uh, I'll just take, uh, take uh, three examples. We show that one well, has to take supply and demand a little bit more, more seriously. First example is care work. Um, I have a student called uh, Frank Avenbeuren, she's Dutch, not uh, Flemish, uh, she's an EY uh, grad student now, um, who's working on that issue in the Netherlands, uh, the UK, and Italy. Um, if you get care of both looking at uh, taking care of children uh, before uh, school, or uh, taking care of the elderly, um, and we look at the data, just you know, answers to survey that say, who takes care of your child? A public daycare, private daycare, your grand your parents, a member of your family, and there's a very odd category who says no one. <laughs> I, I think it's really scary. It's like three percent say no one. So I just imagine street urchins or <laughs> something like that. Um, in Italy, it's over fifty percent are going to say a family member. If you ask the same question in the Netherlands, obviously, you know, that we are at less than 10%, no more than a few percent. Um, and why do I take the example of children first? Is you don't build daycare overnight. Daycare is typically the kind of uh, uh, institution that uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of constraints about, you know, you have to train particular personnel. You don't change from a familial, what is called a familial welfare state, where indeed the grandparents are close by and can take care of your children. You don't have many children in Italy, but this, you know, 
<laughs> that's what, the good thing for, for them is indeed they don't have a, I mean, not in the long term, in the short term, it's not as if they need that many daycare. But still, this is not something that you can change, a system that you can change uh, 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 overnight. At the same time, clearly, if you look at the statistics, there are more women working, obviously, in Italy, and there's also more people moving to uh, places where there is work, and therefore, you know, don't always have their parents uh, nearby or an uncle or an aunt. So you indeed have a demand for migrant labor in that case of people, well, and, uh, and there's no alternative obvious supply. This is absolutely not the case in the Dutch or Swedish system, or you know, I could add other elements, or you know, uh, comparing north and, uh, and south. And then, you know, in some cases, it's not just a north-south divide. I'm just giving this example from this PhD thesis. But clearly, there you can see that the solist, you know, you understand the contra you know, what seems a contradiction between Berlusconi, you know, tough talk from his coalition, Berlusconi and his coalition, of course, uh, Bossi and Fini uh, on the illegals, etc. And this huge exception, which is the regularization of the badenti, which are these people who take care of uh, uh, also the old people. Because I said it's hard to build daycare, it's the same with, of course, old people's uh, home. Um, so there's a past dependency in this welfare state, which means you know, that there's, of course, different kind of, uh, 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 of demands. Um, and so I would not generalize on extending and soliciting. So sometimes, of course, there are political reasons in the Netherlands, for instance, to politicize the issue, but there's also, on the top of that, not such a demand. There are alternatives in some sense, in the, uh, in the way the welfare state has been, uh, uh, um, uh, in some sense, institutionalized uh, 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 for a long time. You could say the same thing about labor market institutions, and by that I mean, what are the training system, uh, what are the contract system, you know, long-term contract, etc. Uh, hiring and firing policy, there's also a huge, there's a huge literature of that, of course, in, in Europe by political economists. Uh, and there, again, your ability or not to uh, um, attract workers or to give them, um, um, but also to, I mean, in some times, uh, in irregular uh, uh, situation, it uh, varies uh, tremendously, of course, uh, and I don't have time to, to go into that, but between the UK on the one hand, for instance, and even the continental Europe, there's actually uh, what, what's called in the political economy jargon, coordinated and uncoordinated uh, 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 market economies. Um, so I'll come to my second example, which is the retraining of the unemployed. Uh, Migration is a solution, but there are other solutions. It's in so, in so far as there is some kind of realization within the, 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 the bureaucracy, within the ministries, if you will, or the institutions in charge of labor policy, uh, um, of a range of, uh, of alternatives. And it might be a quick fix alternative, it might be easier in Ireland to bring in people from other parts of Europe or even from outside of Europe than to retrain uh, former industrial workers in declining uh, sectors. So it's easier actually to bring in that, uh, 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 that migrant. As you know, there's a big crisis in Ireland <laughs> and there are still people who say, well, if the migrants, they work harder, etc. Uh, but in fact, it's not so much that. It's you're bringing people who are, who are you know, retraining someone who has been working in, you know, an industrial job uh, uh, to uh, what in fact was emerging in Ireland is the uh, IT, uh, 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 IT work, of course, it might be uh, uh, easier. But there are, in fact, um, uh, countries, especially those that are very much involved in activation policy, you know, which is called sometimes called welfare to workfare uh, shift, uh, that very much which are northern countries where there's already anti-immigrant policies, I mean, sorry, popular sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, said, no, we have to invest in retraining, we have, and, and rather than that, migration. So it's, it's a more, across Europe, you see very, but to understand that, you really have to look, not at immigration policy, but at labor market and welfare state policies. Uh, immigrant policies are not some kind of ad hoc, migrants come, and thus we react 
and you know define this you know migration or integration policy. It's linked to a very much more complex set of sectoral policies and institutions. Uh, strawberry picking. Uh, it's probably it's my last story now. Yeah, so uh, do I have a conclusion? No, yes, but for another guy. Um, strawberry picking. So this is a student, Mark Miller, uh, of Piotr Glova. He's Polish and he works on a um, uh, uh, place called Huelva in Spain. Um, and he focused on strawberry picking. And I learned so much from that one case study uh, that I have to sort of somehow share it with you because of, of how telling it is. So strawberry picking. Initially, there were Spanish locals involved in strawberry picking. It's a very horrible job, a very hard job. And very soon, <laughs> there were very few locals who wanted to do this strawberry picking. The next thing that was, uh, and, and in any case, there was no involvement in the Spanish state until 2000, 2001. Basically, employers were trying to organize, find workers, and they found workers uh, in particular in North Africa and in Morocco, but these were therefore irregular workers. And as you may have heard, you know, there were a lot of racist incidents. The most famous one is El Herido, and there was this idea that, first of all, first of all, the government Schengen, we are European members now, we have to you know, respect the law, we cannot, we cannot have all these irregular workers. And then with this idea that the Moroccans, they would never fit, you know, there was a lot of racism. Uh, so after 2001, uh, the national government and the EU steps in and makes well by a kind of laboratory, <laughs> laboratory of circular migration. We solicit these workers, they come, and then they go, right? So the idea is, we, we, the old guest worker idea, but for seasonal work, strawberry picking being, uh, well, it's a big season because it's a uh, very warm country, but still. So they tried, the system was organized, it was e there are EU pilot projects for that uh, uh, in the circular system. They loved, they really loved the poor. They were the, their favorite workers, I'm talking about the employers. They love the Poles. They love these new EU migrants. On top of that, they had, you know, they, but very quickly after 2004, in fact, once they became new citizens, they went to England to better pay job. I mean, there was no competition to picking strawberries in Welva and going to London. I mean, this was just so there was no, no, no one wanted to come. So they started with other, uh, uh, other schemes. The first one was an official scheme in Morocco. And uh, they wanted married mothers. They wanted <laughs> mothers, and married, obviously, you know, not mothers. Why? Because mothers would miss their children and family, and therefore they would return. Now, this created, this was also actually on the Moroccan side, Moroccan government, so that was a good idea too, and you know. So that lasted for a while, but the women, after all, I mean, the whole point was in fact they were right. The women didn't necessarily want to return back to their husband and family in Morocco. So there were some, you know, people who jumped the boat a bit like some of the Chinese uh, in the 70s in the States. Next scheme was with um, uh, Senegal. Senegal, very official, in your front, it's a project. But they were competing with other sectors. And of course, there were many, many more candidates who wanted to come than actual positions to pick the strawberries. And then in the end, when they arrived, they were men. Now, in fact, well, you know, you have to be a woman to pick strawberry in Spain because you have to have dedicated five hands. <laughs> so they were very unhappy with those things. This is an EU scheme for Spain to look good and participate in the scheme, but we, as on the local ground, we don't we want women with you know fine hands. Finally, the last scheme I'll stop there was with Ukraine. And in Ukraine, they sent nurses, doctors, engineers who had never picked a strawberry in their life, obviously. And after two week training, because they get a two week training and then they're off if they can't make it, they said they were very happy they're going to send these people, but, you know, these intellectuals or whatever, what can they do? They cannot pick the strawberry. Now, why do I tell the whole story? This is, by the way, 206, 207, 208. Uh, so 206 Moroccans, 207. Uh, 
a Senegal tour into Ukraine. So this is a very, you know, every season there's a kind of new, so it's a real laboratory of Europe and, and in some sense of Africa. And then you can see that standing and soliciting is a very strange notion. They don't want the Moroccans. They, they send these people, well, there are quotes from his PhD that are, you know, just these people are, I mean, it's very racist quotes, obviously racist quotes by the growers. Um, but the end of the story is actually they're trying to do uh, what's happening in California, hydroponic stronger, hydroponic culture, meaning you don't need people to, you don't need earth, you don't need to pick them, it's all sort of hanging in water. Um, so they don't have to worry about these migrants. But the disconnect in the story between what's happening on the ground and this grand EU sponsored scheme, uh, 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 you know, I think tells us a different, you know, gives us a more complex picture about the origin of the dichotomy that we started with, understanding <coughs> and soliciting, but also about what we mean by skilled migration in, uh, 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 in that case. Um, I don't have time, I want, you know, there's many more things to, uh, to, to say, but I guess I can do it already. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, to your two very, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I wouldn't like to be uh, a policy maker uh, after such a complexifying of uh, the issue, uh, but um, I'm quite sure uh, there are a lot of uh, questions after, after these uh, two presentations. So, the floor is yours. And, uh, Maybe if Christian is willing to react to what uh, Virginie said, that is maybe uh, an opener as well. So, well, it was a very subtle uh, debunking of this um, dichotomy, which indeed is uh, rather ham-handed. Uh, and my idea behind it is clearly that uh, soliciting uh, policies are for the high skilled, right, and the stamming laws uh, with respect to uh, unwanted family people. Perhaps with respect, with respect to unwanted family people, I must even mention the illegals, because they're also part of the state. Uh, let's take it for granted, but what Virginie suggests is that there are other categories, uh, not just high skilled people, with filling our hands uh, to do the right picking of the strawberries, also that is wanted, in a way solicited. Uh, so the uh, uh, food uh, dichotomy, I, I, I suggest that um, doesn't really hold much water if you look uh, at uh, the cases that jump the uh, uh, category. You know? so, uh, I find it fully persuasive. In the market, you cannot be accused of being well, this, this student who studies a uh, uh, Mark, a student of Mark, uh, going very much in this legal, legal, uh, what's interesting as well is they wanted also legal workers. You know, there's this idea that people just want, you know, these employers, they all want to, well, in Italy, that's, that's the case in some cases, they want slave labor in law, etc. In fact, uh, they, they, they evolve very, very quickly on this issue as well. So. I wouldn't go too far in debunking all these uh, these. No, that's right. I said we was, need dichotomies for thinking. Uh, it's a starter. It's a starter. Mm -hmm. Then you discover things are more complex and you have to refine. Uh, uh, that's quite obvious. Uh, but I wouldn't go all that uh, road, which of course you never intimate to do in, in debunking that dichotomies as such. Uh, it makes perfect sense to me uh, to say that uh, the uh, integration Control and cotton is indeed, so that's one of the most interesting developments in recent years that that distinction is becoming blurred. Because what integration from abroad is, it is a control policy. It is a policy, uh, it is making it impossible for unwanted uh, family migrants to, uh, to uh, move to the Netherlands. And it's all under this rubric of, of integration. So it's, it's uh, clearly something that. Uh, renders the distinction at absurdum. Uh, 
Mm. I'm not sure, and, and also to a degree, the legal, uh, illegal, of course, in America you cannot even say illegal, you say undocumented, irregular, <laughs> right? It's, uh, PC, uh, it's, it's not PC to say illegal. Also that category in, in some countries uh, doesn't hold much water. Uh, in, in Italy, where you are in the legal spectrum for a year after the next, uh, after the most recent uh, um, amnesty, and then you fall illegal again because they have a very incomplete uh, permanent uh, status system. So, uh, in other countries, however, there's a clearer sense that you can keep these two categories apart. Uh, yeah. No, uh, I mean, I mostly agree with uh, most of the things you said, and uh, particularly the strawberry example was uh, highly interesting. I didn't know there was so much variation in one year you go for Ukrainians. I have the paper, I'll be happy to send it. I mean, what you describe here is actually something um, altogether different. It's ethnic preferencing. Selectivity. The Poles are wanted, the Moroccans are absolutely beyond the pale, right? They are Muslims and Spaniards, uh, Castilian uh, Spanish identity is all against the war, the, the Moors, right? Uh, so uh, uh, that comes in an altogether different dimension uh, under the label of ethnic selectivity. Um, um, indeed, here, the stemming soliciting notion also makes little or one has to modify it. Uh, to, to me, uh, when I... Um, but the, yeah. why did I mention that is these are precisely part of this idea that the EU now wants to say, we want, you know what you say, it's not just the blue card, it's we want to manage migration, we want to organize legal labor migration. So these are pilot schemes under that same general uh, term that you mentioned, this idea. We do, you know, now we will organize it, we will manage it. This is also very much UN vocabulary, you know, this idea. And therefore we organize it. And so it's organized at diplomatic level between governments. And then these people actually go to a place called Welba. You know, I mean, this complete, apparently there's a lot of missing links between all these diplomats and, and the strawberry growers, if you, if you will. But it's also this idea we want we will be able to manage labor official legal labor migration in a tit for tat for more control more expulsions back to uh, to Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and North Africa, and this deal of you know uh, not for the legal and illegal. And the what here is standing? What is soliciting this? Yeah, uh, also so good kind of solution. <laughs> Anybody in the audience willing to raise an issue or to, to, to ask a question? I had one because when you were talking about and, um, and it comes again to this uh, importance of dichotomies and then to construct them uh, probably by like them, you were talking about the views in their two kinds of important as of right migrations in Europe, asylum and family migration, and the reducing of the asylum has been, uh, asylum seekers has been quite successful. Um, and with family migration it seems to be more difficult, but what is successful in the sense that numbers decrease, but where are these people? Are they not coming anymore or are, are they now coming illegally? We saw, I mean, when we did some research, it was in 2000 on, on the planet migration. Depending on the country where people come from, people claim for asylum. Uh, depends probably there is a conflict, then they think, is there abuse or is there not abuse? I will not talk about it. But then you can claim asylum if you come from Congo, because there is a conflict, and even though you were not uh, a political activist, there is more possibility that you will have it than when you come from. Poland, for example. Um, so a lot of people who formerly would ask asylum with all these um, restrictions in society now don't ask for it anymore and they're still there. So um, they're now in this kind of um, category of unwanted migration that's also still wanted because um, uh, needed for the labor market too. So I wonder with um, family migration, um, what can happen if, it, um, if it's 
restricted in the same way as with the sun. One doesn't know yet. Yeah. You have a lot of, I mean, one trend I see is the mm -hmm. number of illegal minors and illegal young adults. The one more over, you know, this category of people who cannot, for instance, you know, there's a lot of change of laws where you have to bring all the children at the same time. Or, mm -hmm. And then, you know, in fact, you have situations, especially for North Africa, where you have this left, you know, some were left, and they, are, and they cannot no longer go through the official procedure. Uh, and typically in some of the... Uh, the mobilization, you see a lot of 19, 20, 21 year old, uh, yeah, and they could be Moroccan or from, from other places that, be, that fell in the cracks, if you will, of, because of the restriction. At the same time, usually this mobilization, etc., so they become, as we say, first inexcusable, irregularizable, and the doom doom the kind of situation where you can't be, uh, but they're not really regularized, they're not really, and that's so the. the you see that more and more, and also with the minor, yeah, you have more sort of, yeah, some minors without papers, so to speak, uh, than, than you had before. So people will really fall in some kind of a legal void because of the way that the, or because their family typically, there's also the resources, right? Your apartment has to be a certain size, uh, you have to have a certain salary, all these very, you know, I'm not, the, the, the real change has been conditions, right? The real conditions of application of family education. And that's where you end up saying, well, yeah, I can bring two legally, but I can, you know, have two more, or if they come, you know, they can go to school, because they can go to school as a legal, but they can, they, they're, you know, they're, they're living in the shadow. This is a fairly new, I mean, I'm talking about friends, I, I, I'm not there to speak out of other cases, but, but that's, that's fairly, you can, and we know about it because there's actually case mobilization that Auntie Ellerman would call it uh, around these cases. Here now these cases are called, there's a mobilization campaign now going on in, in Belgium and these are these um, Article 8 inexpulsible people mm -hmm. eh, because they have the right to the family life but they are, they are not legal yet because the family reunification procedure is too complex and they are here but uh, uh, they cannot be exposed. They will not be exposed because they have their family here, but they are illegal. But that can only be an interim well, condition. It, it is, but <laughs> sometimes it happened for years. I've, I've met, uh, I've met persons who were here for 20, 30 years illegally uh, because also, but that's different questions. People uh, cannot return when you're not, when you're a migrant. You don't have citizenship. You cannot return for a longer period than six months, and people don't all know this uh, situation, and then go back to the country. After six more than six months, they come back, they lose their papers, but maybe they have been living here for 20 years, and then um, this interim situation becomes sometimes very long. But that's a different situation. But there are lots of these illegal, unex a lot of numbers, but. Um, quite big group of unexposable illegals <laughs> because of Article 8. Yeah. In Belgium we even have illegal elections, so... Ah. <laughs> well, but those about this um, limbo, um, people call it that way, from asylum law, mm -hmm. right? Because those who are acknowledged according to the United Nations Convention, uh, it's a very high threshold to, to show you are politically mm -hmm. persecuted. <coughs> and most people are actually, as you say, geduldet, tolerated. They are humanitarian yeah. uh, refugees, not convention refugees. And, and, and for them, the kind of second category of um, mm -hmm. acceptance regime applies. Right? In principle, only temporary, they can always be sent back uh, when the situation relaxes uh, at home, uh, but at home, uh, yeah, they cannot be sent as long as there's a, a danger to their life, even though it's not the United Nations defined as a kind of day. So uh, it's a non refoulement norm which protects them. And, you know, this is a very difficult policy uh, for states to pursue because they cannot totally relax on these geduldet people that invite too many of them from all the crisis zones to need to come in the entire world. Um, but you also cannot be systematically tough on them because it's very bad press and usually these people 
uh, if they are sent back then uh, at dawn, you know, and then the whole press corps and uh, photographs are around. So one knows about them from the side of the world. I'm, I'm rather surprised to hear that also family unification rules produce uh, similar limbo uh, people in such situations. But overall, Belgium is, I was always amazed, uh, as little as I know about it, one of the most liberal migration regimes in Europe, if not the most liberal. One can only fathom that the Belgian people are so uh, engaged in beating up uh, one another amongst themselves that they have no time to become xenophobic, <laughs> as it were. Also, uh, the citizenship regime is remarkably liberal. It's kind of a a reinvention of the use domicili uh, notion, which had been left behind with the introduction of use uh, uh, sanguinis uh, under Napoleon, um, in, in that only three years of residence is enough to get automatic entitlement without even language testing. Man, and that's the muddy Belgian word as language testing. Right? It's under revision, this system. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling, so let's go. <laughs> More interventions? Just one, one thing we thought that he could touch, which is interesting, but it's, uh, um, which I thought would be mentioned in the question, so I'm asking the question for ourselves. Um, this notion about work, we didn't we say, well, let's forget about the evils. Well, let's concentrate on the evils. There's this real I, strength idea, you said, that, you know, immigrants have to be useful, good immigrants are working immigrants versus the family. My words, although obviously this family might have stuff in work as well. But you know, this kind of dichotomy between the one who come and work and contribute. Um, and that's very relevant actually to the whole discussion now on illegal migration. Uh, as you know, in France there's strikes going on and Sarkozy just said, you know, there are no more regularizations. And I think uh, the new way, you know, as I mentioned, the NGOs were stuck in this humanitarian discourse, human rights discourse, Article 8, Article 3, and that. that. Of the, human, of the Human Rights Convention, and now more using the own, you know, saying we are working, we are here, we are working, we are contributing to the economy, more an American actually, the way in the West you would probably argue. So we're not asking for humanitarian uh, regularization, we are contributing, and, 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 um, and that actually makes it more difficult for the uh, uh, for the right, I mean, Sarkozy was very strict, but we have elections coming up soon in France, as usual. And so he was, you know, back to his. Uh, but within the right, it's hard to say we want 50% labor migration, and then these illegal workers say, well, we are working, we're here, and we are working, and, you know, paying our taxes, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah, um, the problem in Europe is over regulated labor markets mm -hmm. coming from France, so it gets a uh, very strong flavor and sense. Uh, Therefore, to, to, to move from 10 to 50 percent of uh, economic migrants uh, under the employers who uh, would hire such people. Uh, once you're employed in France and you pass the uh, uh, kind of probation period, you basically become unfireable. Right? You cannot be fired anymore. French labor law is uh, hugely protective. Uh, and, and that is one reason that uh, so much, how to say, um, resort to the welfare coffers, um, even among newly arriving, lowly skilled, indeed, immigrants on the family ticket. Many of them become immediately dependent on welfare. And that is something totally unknown to North America and the classic immigration countries, which have unregulated labor market. You get a job, of course, a job itself. One will not pay for your bills. You need two, three, multiple jobs, right? And you still uh, may want to have to live in your car uh, rather than uh, being able to pay to pay for rent. So the, the problem in Europe is over-regulated, uh, protective, protectionist labor markets that make it very difficult for migrants to get their food into the door. Except the UK, um, Italy, and etc. That's why yeah. I said the labor market institutions yeah. are different in some places. That's oh, yeah. where the migrants are growing. That's right. In your, your case about the UK, if you take into account the hiring and firing of policy regulation of labor market, it's easier. They also take less, they don't have the training system in Germany, you know, you get general skills, it's fine. 
So there are still differences within Europe, I think. There are more. One but you wonder how you can make this uh, this fancy move from suffer to chosen without the fundamental restructuring of the labor market. Of, of, of labor law. Of course, Sarkozy is, is doing that. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, he's very complicated, detailed, ambitious mm -hmm. things. But that's one of his projects to flexibilize. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tony Blair was this, uh, this idol after all. Uh, but this is. Uh, an uphill struggle, mm -hmm. to say to say the least. Mm -hmm. That's one of Europe's biggest problems: overregulated labor markets, which, uh, is by definition, marginalizes new companies. Mm -hmm. oh. I also have a different question to the migration from the MENA region. You showed that map. I find it very interesting that you said that the high skilled are basically not going to Europe, but around 80 percent was it of the low skilled are going uh, to Europe. Now we, we know that the only channels legally are either temporary or circular migration at the moment. But when you then came with your example of, of the strawberry picking, which would be a classical example for circular migration, and we heard that they are actually um, ethnic preferences and they don't want Moroccans. So this is not working, but the pressure is still there. What other legal instruments does the EU or Spain, for example, have? I mean, Ah. If you just look at these You mean they all go, the educated people all go to North no, no, America like, because they have no possibilities to end up in Europe? No, but I mean like the, if 80% of the low skilled are targeting Europe and the only uh, possibilities we have are, for example, circular migration schemes and some of them are apparently not working because there are, as we saw, some ethnic preferences. And, and the pressure is not going down, I mean, there's still migration pressure. So what, what would be the alternatives? Yes, I will answer that. First, because some of the fact that some is, um, in fact, family migration. It's not just all la labor migration. You know. So in that case... I would say that most of it should be family migration. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Or just it's irregular. Just Actually, do these numbers include uh, irregular people? I don't think no, so, because no, no. by definition... No, but they, they, but they do include family yeah. migration, yeah. which uh, explains... Uh, and the numbers are also, I mean, right? They're um, not as important uh, as before, compared to new flows from other, from other places. But indeed, I mean, it's... Uh, the, the flows from Morocco are subsiding substantially in places like Spain. But these numbers, uh, this is where I got them from, uh, are prominently quoted um, in an e, uh, e, uh, European Commission report that lays out the blue card scheme. Because the idea was here, we get the crap, we want the crop, I mean the elite. Uh, right? um, uh, and uh, the original idea was the, the competitive advantage of Europe uh, compared to Canada or Australia is we will have one card uh, that gives access simultaneously to 27 labor markets. That was the market niche that Europe tried to have or to, uh, to, uh, to, to develop uh, in the race for talent. And of course, as we know, the outcome is uh, the total destruction of this initial proposal in that uh, 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 if you are in, accepted on a blue card in one European country and then after 18 months uh, you want to move somewhere else, the other state can always say no and you have to apply actually for a new blue card in that other state. So uh, it's a total defeat of the original, the conceived competitive advantage uh, of Europe to have one, one ticket that accesses uh, 27 labor markets simultaneously. But a great success because of our <laughs> yeah, it's it's a rather strange um, directive, I must say. But that's how they count, right? One directive down, <laughs> one you know you have this scoreboard of all the things you have to do, the five-year plan uh, after Tampere and Nap the Hague and Moscow. You know, well, the important uh, thing is the foot in the door of labor migration now is shifting up to Europe. That was totally uh, unconceivable still a few years ago. Uh, and all European Union, uh, Commission uh, forays into that direction were systematically blocked. Uh, so it's a very meekish scheme, but uh, it will not be the last word. Uh, probably it's probably indeed the first step in the Europeanization of, of 
of economic migration, which is so fast, totally out of the picture, because there was no incentive, safety and building of fortress incentive uh, of the member state to have a European uh, rule in, in, in that sector. So um, um, it's only the first move. So, and according to you, what are the factors that have uh, allowed this development of uh, passing uh, the blue card directly? Uh, why, why then you have such a directive? The first step uh, in, the, in the legislation on economic migration. Yeah, I, I possibly I couldn't quite. So, what is the. Why, 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 are, why was it passed? Why did they do the blue card directly? How come it didn't fail and it was passed? Because it's costless for member states. It's totally costless. It's an additional um, regime to national regimes that will continue to <coughs> to, to, to exist. It's, it's completely costless, as I see it. And it's nicely window dressing, indeed. One sees the general attractiveness um, <coughs> to make, indeed, Europe more competitive. The idea here is to live up to the Lisbon agenda, right? To make it the most dynamic and competitive uh, high-tech economy in the entire world. Um, um, and that's nice to show it. It's purely a marketing uh, uh, gadget, I would say. You know, because it doesn't change anything on the ground. This is not really a positive note to end, so I want you to say something. <laughs> oh, no, I said that it doesn't, no, it's not constraining enough. I think the national governments are still doing their individuals in unbilateral agreements, uh, trying to, to solicit. And I completely agree with Christian that, you know, uh, they're clearly not attractive enough compared to many other uh, places uh, uh, in the world. The only thing that uh, has happened now is the supposedly unwanted flows from the East are now very much welcome flows from the new member states because often these are skilled people and when things get bad they return to Poland for six months wait for things to get better in the UK and come back they are the very flexible uh, uh, labor force but uh, but this race for talent remains for me extremely nationalistic and uh, in the same way we've seen some of the reactions actually after the financial crisis, this is not just about labor migration, but you know, <laughs> when the going gets tough, clearly. But that blue card scheme, you know, I think there's much more uh, to follow in, um, in some of the more specific uh, um, sectoral directives uh, that will come, that are part of this larger GATS agreement on all freedom of services, where Europe is also going to uh, fight very hard to uh, export the skilled people it wants and not to import the, you know, the skilled people that are already, you know, that are corporations that are very close and do not want too much competition from the outside. <coughs> so it's it opens country. up uh, uh, yet a totally different uh, vista and uh, important, fundamentally important aspect of immigration policy, the demographic term. Europe is turning into retirement. And it doesn't do much to um, work against that by means of immigration policy. Perhaps because the numbers indeed are of such horrific <laughs> high uh, uh, that it's uh, unrealistic, uh, but uh, uh, there is no, um, the numbers always have to stay small. That is imperative, that does not follow from the needs of demography, but from the logic of competitive politics. And that the parameter of policy making is indeed a, a deep and growing public hostility towards uh, immigrants, broadly seen, and uh, ever more skillful parties and entrepreneurs of the Le Pen kind to take uh, advantage of that. And, and, and that um, is impairing, in a way. Um, um, forward-looking European solutions to, uh, to the demography problem. In Canada, it's very clear. Immigration policy is demographic policy. You need to settle the Northern Territories. Uh, they have other problems. They are meant to be for the Northern Territories, and they all want to go to Montreal or to Vancouver. Okay, and it's, uh, it's separate. And, and Europe, no European leader dares to speak uh, in, in the demography. Only 
in the European Commission test, actually, and that is the non uh, democratically non accountable political body of Europe. So it's uh, it's a free game for them uh, to do that. They don't have to be elected, or they're not watched by hostile people, as it were. So, uh, yeah, overall, Europe's uh, show on the immigration front is, is an absolutely really dismal, uh, uh, depressing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 8 o'clock. I would like to thank you both for your interventions and the, the good discussion. Thanks for the audience. And uh, see you next week uh, for talking about Schengen with uh, Monica de Boer and Tony Cunha.